How do you do? Hello, everyone. Aaron Boster here. And thank you, as always, for learning about MS with me. This is Carolyn Conway. She's joining us from The Ohio State University. And we're going to be having a very special educational presentation tonight. Howdy do, Aaron Boster here with the Boster Center for MS. And if you have pen and paper, guys, get them out because this is a tour de force, things that you're not going to hear anywhere else. Caroline, welcome so much. Thank you very, very Thank much for you. being here. Tell the people a little bit about yourself and teach yeah, us. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, this is something I've been looking forward to for a really long time. Um, and I'm just so honored and excited to get to spend the evening with everyone. We are happy to have you. Thank you. Yes. So as Dr. Boster said, my name's Caroline. I am a second year graduate student studying speech language pathology at Ohio State University. Um, so I did four years of undergrad also at Ohio State. And now I'm in my second year of my graduate program. I kind of came to this position um, and being interested in multiple sclerosis um, because of my mom. Um, in December of 2015, my mom was diagnosed with MS after about a year of, you know, having some symptoms and being bounced around to a handful of doctors and, you know, getting some different diagnoses. MS is kind of what everyone settled on. And so since then, um, this is something that she and my family have have been tackling. And so I have a really close personal connection. Um, and I've been interested in the disease, um, specifically from a speech pathology standpoint. So that's kind of what I'm here to talk with you guys about tonight. Um, so some people might know what a speech pathologist is, because maybe you had a child who couldn't say their R's, or maybe um, you have a family member who has hearing loss and speech pathologists totally help with those things. Um, but tonight we're obviously gonna talk about our role um, specifically working with adults with MS. The three big things that we focus on are speech, swallowing and cognition. We don't think too much about it when we're eating dinner with our families, um, but there's a lot of muscles and a lot of um, things that have to happen for us to swallow safely and efficiently. So dysphagia is the big fancy medical term for difficulty swallowing. So having problems with your swallowing. So phasia is the kind of Latin term for eating and dys means it's not working too well. So dysphagia, eating isn't going too well. That swallowing portion, um, there might be some deficits there. So some symptoms of dysphagia that you might experience would be coughing while you're eating. So whether that's with liquids or solids, if you're noticing a lot of coughing, that's something to monitor. If you feel like something's kind of going down the wrong pipe, and on occasion that's normal, you know, that you know something just kind of goes down the wrong pipe and you cough and you get it out. But if that's happening a lot, that's something to really be aware of and to let your physician know about. Another symptom um, we can see is trouble initiating a swallow, mm -hmm. especially with MS because it's, you know, has to do with um, that muscle weakness. There's a lot of muscles up in here that are involved with swallowing. And if they're not all working together, you might be ready to swallow and have that food or drink in your mouth, but those muscles might not all be coordinated correctly. Get the memo yet. Yeah, exactly. Right. So your brain's telling you it's time to swallow, but those muscles aren't quite listening. So that's definitely something that we can see too. But I want to back up for a second and just talk about why swallowing is so important. Number one, it's socially important. We all like to eat dinner with our family. We all like to go to our favorite restaurant. Um, you know, a lot of times when we make plans with someone, it's, hey, do you want to grab coffee? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to try that new restaurant tonight? And if you're having trouble swallowing, that can really deteriorate your quality of life. If you're nervous to go to a new restaurant or you feel like it's inhibiting your ability to socialize with others. That is such a good point. You know, there's a major issue in MS and that's social isolation. And that's an example of social isolation that I never thought about where someone might say no to a dinner date mm -hmm. because they're embarrassed about potentially choking when they eat. Yeah, exactly. So that's um, kind of thing number one, why we care about swallowing. And also it's medically necessary. We need to be meeting <laughs> all of our nutritional and hydrational needs, ideally by mouth. And so making sure that you're getting enough calories and that intake is providing you with enough energy to sustain you throughout your day. And then also, you know, what can happen if the swallowing isn't, you know, working correctly can be that aspiration pneumonia. So basically what 
what would happen is if your airway isn't protected. So there's two tubes when you swallow. You have your esophagus, which is that back tube, and then you have your trachea, and that's your front tube. Your trachea leads to your lungs. Yeah. When you swallow, you want that food to be going down the back tube to your esophagus, which leads to your stomach. But if you're having trouble swallowing and it's going into that front tube, it can go into your lungs. And what can happen is that bacteria can grow and it can cause pneumonia. So if you are having any suspicion, coughing, sputtering, gasping when eating, that's a real big red flag. I mean, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up when I hear that. Um, at the risk of being a little bit morbid, you know, there's three ways that people impacted by MS can die. One of them is urosepsis. One of them is a, um, a bed sore. The third way is aspiration pneumonia. So if you're listening to this and you sputter and cough when eating or drinking, you need to talk to your neurologist and you need them to ask them to send you to Caroline or someone <laughs> like Caroline so that we can help figure that out. Yeah, exactly. That is the biggest thing. And so we're going to talk about aspiration pneumonia. So um, one important way that you can prevent aspiration pneumonia is by having really good oral hygiene. Mm -hmm. So making sure you're brushing your teeth at least twice a day, especially if you're having difficulties with your swallowing, because what that does is it cleans out your mouth and gets yeah. rid of any of the bacteria that might be in there. So if you are to swallow and it were to go down the wrong pipe, it would be clean and it wouldn't be carrying bacteria with it. Um, so really making sure you're brushing your teeth, flossing, um, using mouthwash, all that good stuff is one way you can also prevent aspiration pneumonia. Oh, no. So with dysphagia, if you are experiencing these symptoms and you go to your physician and he refers you to a speech pathologist, they're going to do a swallow study. And so this swallow study is going to be called a modified barium swallow. So we am, um, abbreviated MBS. And so basically what it is, is a video x-ray of you eating and drinking. So they give you different textures of food and they put barium in it, which is the stuff that makes it light up on the x-ray. Because if we just gave you normal food, we wouldn't be able to see anything on the x-ray. So we need to put some stuff in there. And so what they do is they have you eat and drink different things and they see exactly what's going on. So maybe it's an issue with your tongue and it's not pushing the food back. Or maybe it's an issue with um, your throat muscles. Yeah, so that's what it looks like. So you can see the food being pushed back and going down their esophagus. It's really, really cool. And you'll get into very specific phases. Yes. Like, so the front of the mouth is a different phase than the back of the mouth. Yep. And so you can look at that and start to really get granular about where the problem and is. We kind of examine it and we go frame by frame to see, okay, mm -hmm. what muscles are engaged? What mm -hmm. muscles aren't engaged? What is the issue here? Why is food going down the wrong way? And what are we going to do about it? Does it taste bad? Um, it doesn't taste great, to be honest. It kind of tastes chalky. Okay. Um, so that brings us to our treatment for dysphagia. So there's kind of two main lines of treatment. Number one would be swallow strategies. So things that you can do to strengthen those muscles um, and to help you um, get the food down and going where we want it to. So just a couple of examples and things that you can implement in your daily routine right now if you're having deficits with your swallowing. Number one would be always making sure you're sitting completely upright when you're eating. You cannot eat safely if you're laying down. If you're like this, things are likely to go the wrong way. So always making sure you're sitting all the way up. This is important because many, many red-blooded Americans do not eat at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. And so if you're used to putting a plate on your lap and watching television mm -hmm. and Netflix, you're setting yourself up to choke. And so we're talking about in a, in a hard back seat, sitting you know upright. Yep. Very important tip that all too often we just skip. Right. So always sitting upright, tip number one. Number two, taking small bites and small sips. So I know if you have this beautiful dinner and you wanna just throw it all in and you know scarf it down, it can be tempting. However, taking small bites and small sips is one easy way that you can um, you know, decrease those risks um, of things going the wrong way. So let's demonstrate. So give us an example, if you would, of like what you would consider is like a good small sip. Okay. So it should really only require like one swallow. So it's not like you're chugging it down. If you're having to swallow and swallow and swallow, that's too big. That's way too big. All right. So that's a huge tip. So if you put enough liquid in your mouth that you can't swallow it in one go, that's too much. So let me try to do a good swallow. Yep. We're sitting upright. All right. We have one swallow. 
Woo, and it right. went down because we're not coughing, we're not throat clearing, we know everything passed clearly. Awesome. Perfect. Those are two um, easy tips. And then the third one that you can implement is going slowly. Um, so taking your time while you eat. This is also helpful for like digestion and just making sure your food is being processed. Um, but, you know, again, if you're shoveling food in your mouth, you're more likely um, your muscles are more likely to get confused and to get, you know, kind of out of whack. So they need that time to process to send that message from your brain to your swallowing muscles, chew it up and then send it down instead of shoveling it all in. And then you're coughing and choking and things get out of hand. Another time that I think we're at significant risk is when we try to talk and eat. Yes, that's now, a huge Now, in the setting of multiple sclerosis, if you have any dysphagia, even like a little, and you're trying to do something like talking and eating, you're a setup for choking. Yeah, but try an effortful swallow. You'll feel this part right here. This is your voice box. And it you goes like, up. You like try to just focus on it or push on it. Yeah, so really focus on swallowing, pretending like you have like a big golf ball stuck in your throat and you want to get it down. All right, let's do it on the count of three, guys. So if you're listening to us, swallow with us on the count of one, two, three. Can you right. feel those muscles yeah. really engaging? And so just like if you, you know, go to the gym and you work out your arms and legs, you can also work out your swallowing muscles mm -hmm. and your speech pathologist can give you more specific tips based on your specific type of dysphagia. But that's just an example of something they might have you do like three Reps, sets yeah. Yeah, of 10 or whatever. When would a straw be important? When might that be like a good adaptive measure and when would it be a bad adaptive measure? So straws are tricky. So... For some people, straws are totally okay and they can swallow with them and everything works, um, especially if you have motor deficits and it's harder to pick up the cup mm -hmm. and it can spill out the sides of your so mouth. So if you can put your lips on it and yeah. you can drink. Yeah, so if you have that good um, oral closure, so if you can get your lips around a straw and safely swallow, that's a great option. Where straws can be kind of problematic is if you have dysphagia um, pharyngeal phase, which is like the, the kind of throat phase. And if it's going over into your into your pharynx before your muscles are ready, ah. um, then the straws can kind of be problematic because people are more likely to drink quickly with a straw. I know, you know, if you go through McDonald's and you get a Diet Coke and it tastes so good and you're slurping it down rather than, you know, if you're taking a second to sip and set it down. So you would actually not recommend, no, recommend no. A straw as a technique. You would put that aside. Yeah, for most people, we um, don't recommend straws. What about a chin tuck? A chin tuck? So when you were yeah. doing this, I thought we were going to do a chin yeah. tuck. So when might that be like a thing that you would recommend to someone? So that's also helpful if you're having, it's called premature spillage. So it's basically if the liquids are going down before your body's ready. And so what happens is if it falls down the back of your throat before your body is ready, then you can cough and choke. So doing a chin tuck, looking down and swallowing with your head down. So it's kind of changes the gravity. So when your head's upright, obviously everything's kind of aligned, but then when you put it down, it forces the liquid to take more time because it almost has to go like up and over the back of Does your throat. Does that help clear the front tube? Is that, are you kind of protecting in that regard? Yeah, yeah, right. it can also help with that too. It's kind of just trying to slow the process down, All right, basically. Okay, cool. So, so a speech pathologist is going to do a barium swallow. You're probably also going to have them do some phonation and some things. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, you're going to be able to sort out, okay, we think that dysphagia is here, here. Yep. Yep. And then they'll give you specific strategies. So that's kind of the one aspect of dysphagia treatment is these compensatory strategies. So things you can do to help manage the symptoms. The other side of dysphagia treatment are modified diets. Mm -hmm. And so this would be in the event that your airway is really you know, at risk and you're not able to protect your airway. And so the speech pathologist would recommend a modified diet. And so that might mean cutting foods up into soft and bite-sized pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so it would mean nothing hard, crunchy, gooey, things like that. So no gummies, no chips, because those things are obviously a lot tougher than scrambled eggs or, you know, waffles cut up into pieces. So there's different levels of diets. We don't have to get into, you know, all of that. So that's an option. So changing your diet to help your swallowing improve. And then, uh, so that can be with solids or liquids. So the other thing that we can recommend is thickened liquids. Mm -hmm. So there's these little packets of thickener and you squeeze them into liquids and it just makes them thicker. And there's different levels of um, thickness. thickness. Yeah, exactly. Of viscosity. Yeah. So, so really you're approaching every angle. You're yes. saying, what can you do physically to change how you swallow? 
And what can you do to the stuff you're swallowing exactly. to make it safer? Yep, right. Is Are thick and liquids, do they taste different? No, they don't taste different. It's just the, the thickness, really. So it's just the consistency that changes. Okay. And I've tried all of them. They're not bad. How, how many sessions does the average person with MS who has dysphagia going to have with a speech pathologist? Is there like a standard or is it super individualized? I would say it's super individualized because it also depends too. So if you're doing these, if you're really independent with your swallow strategies and you're able to do them at home on your own, then there's not necessarily a reason for you to come in for 45 minutes a week and to just sit and swallow if you're able to do that on your own. So likely, I would say for most people, they come in, they get that swallow study, we see what's going on, maybe do a handful of sessions okay. just to train those strategies. Okay. And it's all about giving those cues and teaching people how to do the swallow strategies correctly. And then if we have to modify the diet, doing a lot of education on what to eat, what not to eat, how to prepare food. Okay. But then people usually do pretty well as long as they or their caregiver are able to support them. Yeah, the outcomes are good. If you guys are liking this, another thing that you you can do to show love is to throw a thumbs up in there. And according to my learnings, it helps the YouTube analytics. Today, we talked about swallowing safely so that you can live your best life with MS. And I just want to say thank you so much for this You're didactic. Welcome. This was a tour of force. I'm very hopeful that we would get you to come back sometime. Would you be willing to yeah. come back? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Us? Yes, awesome. for I think sure. That's fantastic. All right, guys, God bless, be safe, and we'll talk to you really, really soon. Take care.